Thank you, thank you. I'm overwhelmed <laughs> that so many people came to listen to what I have to say. Really, I thank you so much for coming. Dear audience, my name is Ben Benninger, and we, my dear wife Crystal, and I are living in Holland, in a suburb not far from The Hague. We have four children, two from my first marriage, Mark and Karina, and two with my dear Crystal, Brian and David. I'm going to turn your volume up some, I think. <coughs> We're going to turn the volume up some. Is that better for the people in the back? Still better? Is that okay now? I was trying to. Okay. We now have. Uh, yeah. We now. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Do I have to start again? <laughs> we, have, we, we now have uh, eight grandchildren. We have a very close knit family. Mark and Karina. I adore my second wife, Crystal, and put her on a pedestal. The four kids have a very close relationship. Let me start by apologizing for my poor English, and even worth a probably horrible pronunciation and accent. But on the other hand, I'm sure that my English is better than your Dutch. <laughs> In principle, I and many of us Holocaust survivors do not open old wounds with pleasure. Because the older you get, the more emotional you react, and the more depressive you get. Not daily, but more and more you feel the pressure of what happened and lack of a normal life of the past. There's another thing why we do not want to speak about this horrible period. Because I personally believe, or better, I am convinced, that if you not have gone personally through such a bad time, it becomes history. Like so many things in life that you have not experienced yourself. Not seeing your beloved ones for over three years, the lack of education, good schooling, and many other important things in life you missed while being in hiding leaves a mark and a stamp on you for the rest of your life. <coughs> Just one day before Holland was invaded by the Germans, on the 10th of May 1940, my parents came back from a vacation in the south of France together with their best, very best friends. In life, sometimes you have friends with whom you deal actually everything, with whom you spend the weekends, you go on vacation with, go to cinemas and theaters, etc., etc. These friends of my parents had exactly the same family as we had, a father, a mother, a son, and a daughter. He, the father, was the owner of an immense bicycle shop. We lived in a town called Enschede, Enschede probably, where I was born, a place in the eastern part of Holland, right on the German border. Before we went into hiding, we have gone through difficult times, and of course many with us. Bombs fell next to our house, for example, and we were very lucky not being hit. Roundups became a daily reoccurring event, and the restrictions were immense. Exclusions from public committees, no Jewish teachers at school, professors' assistants were dismissed from universities, and we as children were not allowed to play with non-Jewish kids, stay inside after six o'clock, after six o'clock, and many, many other limitations. I was six years old when the war broke out, and already in the middle of 1940, we had to walk around with the yellow badge, soon on every part of your cloth, with in the middle the word Jew. I'm sure well known to all of you. We were not allowed 
to go to a normal school, and so we had to go to a school in a synagogue where they tried to give normal lessons. But without saying, not very beneficial for one's education and also disastrous for family life. Somewhere at the end of 1941, in the middle of the night, my parents got a phone call <coughs> telling that roundup, rounds, roundups were being held and that the Germans with assault vents went from door to door at Jewish families. Immediately, my father dressed, left the house, called my uncle and a friend of his, and the three of them made an appointment at a secret place. They cycled and wandered through Holland for the next six weeks, while we did not know where they were. During these six weeks, we were not in contact at all. And then, in the middle of the night, there they came, the Germans, with their assault vans. Hammering on the front door with their boots, their rifles and their pistols, and searched the house. An officer saw that the bed next to my mother was slept in, and he asked, where is he? I do not know, I do not know what you're talking about, my mother said. My daughter, my daughter was ill this night and slept next to me. My husband is on a trip to France, on a business trip to France. And this was apparently the time that my parents began to think of going into hiding. And because of going underground in a fairly early stage, we survived. And because of this early stage, we were the only family on my mother's side in Holland who survived without any human loss. The family came together and intermediaries were asked to help us. And the way they did it saved our lives. We are, of course, very, very grateful for their help, for their voluntary and unpaid efforts, their courage with danger for their own lives if they would have been caught. In the next three and a half years, they took care of us, finding places where we could hide procured identity cards with fake names and ration coupons. My name at that time was Ben Bakker, and my parents died in a bomb attack in Rotterdam. It's a little bit a long introduction, and if you become too bored, just let me know. <laughs> and then, for us all in Holland, the nightmare began. On my grandfather's birthday, February 9, 1942, it was around 8 o'clock in the evening. The whole family was present. All of a sudden, my father stood up and said, Dear ones, some something horrible is going to happen to all of us. In a couple of minutes, Yeti, my sister, Joop, my cousin, and Ben will be picked up by Klaas de Rook, a fervent adherent of communism, conductor of a philharmonic orchestra. And we, are, we, and we are going to break up for a certain period. We do not know for how long. We will be leaving each other in a couple of minutes, and when we separate, we will not know where the three of you are going to stay, and you will not know where we are going to. So that if someone of us will get caught, we cannot betray one another. And indeed, within five minutes, there he was, Klaas de Rook. I cannot remember if and how we left each other, if we said goodbye and if we hugged. My sister Yeti, my cousin Job, and I disappeared. Yeti at that time, 11 years old, Job, nine, and I myself, seven, they on their own bikes, and I, because I was too young, on the luggage carrier of Klaas de Rook's bike. That night, we slept till three o'clock in the night. We had to get up, and we had to bike and bridge that night and the coming day, a distance of exactly 45 miles. And so we set off 
for a new, vague, obscure, and unknown accommodation, and worse, a shelter. We finally reached the new address. He was a very nice man, a Protestant minister, reverend, living with his wife in this very little village, probably better described as a hamlet, with roughly 500 to 750 inhabitants. The couple lived in a parish with, at short distance, some 20 meters, which is 22 yards, a church. The church was encircled by a cemetery. My sister, who was blonde, and Joop, my cousin, cousin, both had the possibility to go to the rural schoolhouse. Due to my Jewish looks and raven black hair, I had to stay behind. In front of the parish, there was a small little garden, <coughs> separated from a street view by a huge hedge where beans, tomatoes, spinach, strawberries, and other types of vegetables and fruits were cultivated. <coughs> Behind the house was an orchard with fruit trees. After one week, Joop left us and was accommodated at another parish three miles away from where we stayed. And one week later, one week later, my sister left for a place somewhere in the middle of Holland. We did not see each other again, not earlier than three years and two months later. Because of my extreme Jewish looks, I could only go outside the house into the small little garden for a couple of hours per day and accompanied only by two gardeners. I could walk around freely in that little garden because it was protected by a huge hedge, hedgerow, high hedgerow. Most of the time I had to stay inside of the house. He, the Reverend, as I said before, was a fantastic man, saving dozens of lives, amongst them Jews, British parachutists and resistant fighters in danger. He was regarded as an exceptional brave man and unique individual. She appeared not to be so pleasant as she looked in the beginning. They gave me several hiding places in case of danger. The hamlet was located very near a river and protected by a huge dike on which German troops regularly move back and forth German tanks, trucks, and other military equipment. And when that was the case, I had to hide in one of the three indicated hiding places. The first one was a very small kitchen cabinet where I could hardly sit, so narrow was it. And the sec second was a hanging wardrobe where I had to hide behind long dresses, coats, and piles of shoes. The worst, however, was the shelter on the cemetery behind the church, in a grave covered with a real tombstone. I can tell you honestly that I still shiver when I think back to that horrible place deep under the ground. She, as I said, was not a very pleasant person. When the minister was preparing his speech and his preach for the Sundays, she was fooling around with the milkman, with lawyers, <laughs> and with several other people. That was, of course, extremely dangerous for me. And when that was the case, she also put me in one of the above mentioned shelters. After the war, I came to know <clears throat> that she ran away with a German officer in 1944 and in 1945 she sneaked off with a Canadian soldier. <laughs> Via our mediators, my parents came to know that I was not treated the way they had hoped, although they did not know where I was located, and urged the intermediaries to find another hiding place. So I was moved to a new aunt and uncle only three months after we went into hiding. I called everybody where I stayed, aunt and uncle. 
The new people lived in a place called Haarlem. Those of you who have visited Holland know where Haarlem lies. Here you find one of the most beautiful museums and precious and beautiful paintings of Franz Hals, a famous Dutch painter, born, however, in Antwerp in Belgium in 1581. The new people whom I stayed with were simple, but brilliant people. He was a streetcar conductor, and she was teaching during the day. They lived in a very tiny, tiny house, and I was not allowed to go out of the house, and therefore my new parents gave me a little dog, dog to play with as a kind of a distraction. <coughs> At Christmas time, 1942, the little dog succumbed. And behind the house was a pocket handkerchief garden where I buried my playmate. And all of a sudden, a window on the second floor of the house next door opened and a little girl, I estimate about 12, 14 years, said, Listen carefully. My father is a member of the Dutch National Movement, a group or probably better qualified as a movement that supported and stood behind the Germans, traitors in the real sense of the word. They handed, she said, caught people over to the Germans and got paid for it. To denounce a Jew, they got the sum of seven guilders and 50 cent per person, and at that time was at less than one dollar. Tomorrow night, she whispered, raids will be held on people in hiding and Jews, and I also have heard that they were talking about you. The window was closed immediately after. The girl, whom I never met again, saved my life. At six o'clock, my uncle came home. I mentioned what I knew and had heard. And one hour later, it was already dark, Christmas time. We went off by bike from Haarlem to Zwolle, a distance of about 80 miles. My uncle pedaling <coughs> and I sitting in the back. We biked the whole night. And so we arrived in Zwolle, where we stayed for two or three nights only. I cannot remember exactly. Our mediators were exceptional people. He was a book bookkeeper and she was just an ordinary housewife <coughs> living in Enschede. They brought me over to their house, awaiting coming events and moreover waiting for and to find a new hiding place. They found a place at Farmers. Very reformed people more or less Presbyterians, exceptional, unique persons whom I dearly loved and with whom I had more affection and affinity than with my own parents, even after the war. They had a son who is still alive and four years older than I am. My life was deeply influenced by these wonderful people who risked their lives to save the little life of a little boy for them in the beginning an unknown creature. Because I got, got good, could not go to school, I had to get up in the mornings around four o'clock together with my aunt and uncle to milk the cows and do the work that has to be done on the farm, to feed the horses, the pigs, the chickens, etc., etc. At noon we always ate a hot meal and before the meal we were praying. And after the meal, my aunt every day first read a piece from the Bible, only the Old Testament, and then we thank God for the meal. They never tried to impose their religion on me, but being there for two and a half years, automatically you deal their daily customs. Every Saturday morning, my hair was treated with hydrogen peroxide. My uncle used for that purpose a toothbrush. So instead of black hair, I ran, ran, ran around with red hair. <laughs> not, far, not far from the farm, the Germans put up a what they called a V1 
launcher device. A V1 was a flying bomb invented probably by your well-known Mr. Werner von Braun and within a radius of three kilo, uh, kilometers, that's 1.85 miles, everybody had to leave their houses, their farms, because the V1 was a very secret mission. And with these flying bombs, they could reach London. Luckily, we, our farm, just fell outside the required, the required forbidden area. That did not mean that did not mean that we were not troubled by the their situated situated Germans. They confiscated horses, food, tractors, and the necessities of life that could help them. Having the Germans so near to our backyard was also a great danger for everybody, but even the more so for persons in hiding. My uncle took the necessary precautions in case of danger. Some 500 meters, 550 yards from the farm, you had Poland. The meadows were separated from each other by small, not very deep ditches. My uncle covered these ditches with an iron sheet of corrugated material under which I could hide in case of. And the danger came one day in the middle of the night. My uncle heard the Germans coming, he dressed me quickly and sent me direction to the ditch. I still hear him shouting, run for your life and put yourself under the police place sheet of cor corrugated material and stay there till we come and pick you up. I ran for my life in the dark behind me, shooting Germans with their rifles. I stayed there the rest of the night and the whole following day. During my stay with these wonderful people, I was not allowed to go to school, and, as I said before. So I had an enormous, serious and considerable lag in development compared with children at the same age. I could hardly read, count and write when the war was over. The danger was not over yet. Next to where we lived was another farm. The people were not very nice, but good enough not to denounce me. However, they had a son-in-law who had other thoughts and wanted to hand me over to the Germans. He knew in the meantime that my aunt and uncle were hiding a Jewish boy. I had to leave the farm for a couple of weeks to calm down the situation aroused between the two neighbors. The next door farmers were convinced to keep their mouth shut because if they did not, not only the Jewish boy, but also the persons who were so brave to shelter him would not survive. To clear the arisen tricky situation between the two farmers, my uncle brought me for a couple of weeks to a reverend somewhere in the middle of Holland. He arranged a hiding place for a short period. I was accompanied at dark to a bus station and the bus driver got instructions to hand me over at a certain village. Driving time was about two hours. At the first stop of that little village he was instructed. He would find a very tall man with a big black bowler hat and a black coat till his ankles, waiting for my arrival. It couldn't miss. The bus driver handed me over to this man and he, the tall man, gave me a hand without saying anything and not speaking at all. And we walked a couple of hundred meters through Heathland to a house with a reed roof in the middle of nowhere. Immediately after arriving there, he brought me upstairs to a little room where I stayed alone for three weeks. The only thing I remember is that I also <laughs> cried, cried for three weeks. I find that place again, but I never managed. After these dreadful three weeks, I could go back to my farm parents. Because in the meantime, everything was calmed down 
between the two farmers and the son-in-law. And so I could stay there for the rest of the two years and eight months with my beloved war parents. In 1945, we were freed by the Canadians. Some parts of Holland were already freed and other parts were not liberated yet. And my parents could not wait to see and embrace me after three years and two months of separation and biked some 35 miles through lines where they were still fighting. However, life had to be picked up again and that was not too easy. During the period that we had not seen each other, my, hiding, my parents were hidden with a family in a house where their hiding place was a little room, 3.3 yards by 2 by 2, in an attic reachable only via a hedge, which was opened only to feed them or handing other essentials to survive or to get rid of the excrements. Can you imagine three years and two months without going outside, spending and bridging that time, this long period, with reading and playing cards? However, they were very happy to meet me and see me, and that is to say physically. Mentally, of course, we were broken. So my parents came to pick me up and came to take me with them. But that was not that easy. I did not recognize them, and thus I did not want to go with them. I wanted to stay with my real parents, the farmer and his wife, who saved my life. During the war, my mother had had a gallbladder operation and looked very pale and weak. But anyhow, after a couple of hours, I had to come along with my biological parents. The farmer, a broad-shouldered sh broad big man, a real farmer, and his wife both collapsed in tears and had to bid farewell to their son, whom they loved with all their hearts, protected and saved his life. Every two months after the war, we and our children paid them a visit till they deceased. The war had an enormous impact not only on the persons in hiding, but also on the people who accommodated them. The son of the farmers is still alive. He lives in the middle of our country and because his parents are not alive anymore, we honor them, my wife and I, by visiting them, their son with, who is 84 every three months. Every time when we take leave, after a couple of hours, we cry bitterly tears. I accepted that my father was my father because I remembered that he was bald-headed when we separated. <laughs> but it took me over a year to accept that my mother was my mother. I was converted completely to Protestantism before and after the meals, I prayed with folded hands, eyes closed. My parents did not wish to obstruct and let things happen. That also took a full year. Never and never again, the relationship with my parents became so close as it should have been. Superfluous to utter that it is absolutely impossible to express gratitude and thankfulness for those who saved our lives, for their efforts to help, their courage, their caring love. The only thing we could do was honor our different parents, or better, aunts and uncles, as well as all our intermediaries with the Yad Vashem decoration. They were also officially honored with the Yad Vashem distinction, righteous, righteous of the nations. And we also planted trees and placing tiles with inscription in the museum in Jerusalem. And I can tell you that during all these presentations, emotions ran away with all of us. I, I think I've told enough about myself and want to go back to the beginning of this expose. My father 
was an agent for a Jewish textile wholesale dealer. He did very well and wanted to start a business of his own. At the same time, he built a freestanding house in Enschede, on the border, the eastern part of Holland, as you remember, near the German border. As always, while building something new, the house turned out to be much more expensive than calculated. <laughs> and my father had not the money for it. His father, an ordinary baker, came to help him with a cap full of golden ducals. His father said, I have not enough money to live on, so you have to give me back the amount I gave you. And by the end of 1941, his best friend, with whom he dealt everything, approached him, telling him that he was offered an escape to Switzerland. But the price was fairly high, 5,000 guilders each, and converted now probably would be hundred thousands of dollars. He said to my father, since we deal everything in life with each other, I want to, to ask you to come with us. And my father said, I have to discuss that with Clara, my mother, and I'll let you know. The outcome was that they did not have the money. So my father said to him, do what you think is best for you, your wife and your children. We would have loved to come with you, join you, but we simply do not have the money, and thus we can't come with you. They left on their way to Switzerland, but the so-called helper turned out to be a traitor and handed the, four over of, uh, handed the four of them over to the Germans just before reaching the Swiss border. In Holland we have a Red Cross information about missing persons. My sister, who lives in Jerusalem, asked me to go there and try to find out what happened to this family. And well, I found out that the mother, the son and the daughter were gassed in Auschwitz, June 1943, and the father one year later in July 1944. So it's a matter of destiny, luck. It cannot be emphasized enough again and again that those who survived the hiding period can in no way express their gratitude, their thankfulness to the brave people who had the enormous courage, effort, and loving care to save people's life, acting out of religious conviction, probably, or simply out of humanity, and jeopardize their own lives. They knew that if they got caught, they would be punished by the death penalty. But the Dutch, unfortunately, did not do enough, although you cannot blame them for that. My father always said, what would we have done if it would have been the other way around. From the 120 Jews who lived in the Netherlands around 1940, 18,000 only survived. There were at a certain time 156,000 Jews, of which 75,000 lived in Amsterdam. And there was included the plus or minus 36 German Jews who fled to Holland between 1933 and 38. A couple of thousand escaped in time to England and the States. 5,000 only survived the concentration camps. Not only I, but also you, owe it to my dear cousin Henry Frozen that I am standing here in front of you. Normally, I do not speak about my past during the war. Not even to my children have I revealed the hiding period for reasons I have explained to you in the beginning. On my 80th birthday last year, I have given them a copy on a DVD, part of the Spielberg project. It is a great privilege that Crystal and I have relatives in America whom we are very close with. Ellen and Ralph Frozen from Alex City, and Carolyn and Henry Frozen here from Birmingham. We feel very, very attached to all of them and their children. And although we are living not very near, we feel, on the other hand, 
as if they live next door. We are very often in contact with mail or Skype. Now, before I close, I want to finish with a few dramatic post-war stories. I have picked out only four. And then after that, I don't want to annoy you any longer. <laughs> <laughs> but before I do so, I want to state emphatically that we people who went into hiding cannot compare ourselves with the people who suffered in the concentration camps. We who had to undergo atrocities, lack of food, had to turn up naked early mornings in the freezing gold by minus four Fahrenheit, shower with freezing gold water, had to work under unimaginable circumstances, go through and suffer from humiliations day in, day out. And although the war is over, for us, Holocaust car survivors, it never is. You will agree. Even after 70 years. And for that reason, it is probably imperative, essential, necessary, and inevitable to tell you just a few stories. The wife of the family I told you about uh, best and intimate friends, of course, who perished in the camps, I had a brother who lived in another city, not far from where they lived. They also went into hiding, separately, as we did. They all came back, except one, their daughter. They reconciled themselves to this fact. They even received an official report from the Red Cross that their daughter did not survive the war. However, half a year later, after the war, in 45, the daughter showed up, came home, entered the dining room. Her father, who was sitting in the chair in the corner of the living room, saw her coming in, got a heart attack on the spot and died. Second story. There was a couple, a client of ours when we had a wholesale dealer, when we were wholesale dealers, uh, got a baby at the end of 1941, a son. And while going into hiding, they could not keep the baby with them and abandoned the kid on the doorstep of an orphanage. This couple went into hiding separately. The man got caught and was murdered. She survived. Somehow, after the war, the orphan home wasn't there anymore. And in 1946, she met a man whose wife was exterminated. They married and had a very, very close relationship and a good life together. They often went to Israel on vacation. And one day, some 20 years, after the war, around 1965, I think, they were lying at the swimming pool of the Hilton Hotel in Tel Aviv. When all of a sudden they bumped into a couple whom they had not seen for years and years. A couple that did not want to stay in Holland after the war anymore and emigrated to Israel. These people lived in the meantime in Tel Aviv and invited them to their house. They went to these people, people's house, and after an hour, there was a knock on the door, and in came two boys. The invited woman fainted immediately, was brought back to the hotel, and her husband said, what was the matter with you? And her answer was, I am almost sure that one of these boys is my son. Her husband called these people, and asked them if the boys were their children. At first he said yes, but came immediately to the hotel telling them that they had picked up these boys at an orphanage. The blood test was taken, and indeed it was her son. He wanted to stay in Israel, did not want to go back to his biological mother in Holland, but came every year, some three weeks, 
to stay with his mother till she diseased. Third story. I mentioned my first hiding address with the minister in that little hamlet. We only met once after the war. That was in 1964 when we, as wholesale dealers in textiles, opened a new building in an industrial area. We invited him and his second wife for the reception and after this encounter we did not hear from each other anymore. However, around the year 2000, some 15 years ago, all of a sudden I got a telephone call <coughs> from a far relation, also by the name of Benninger, who lived in Amsterdam. Hello Ben, this is Leo Benninger speaking. I'll call you and want to ask you something. Right above my apartment, where I live, lives a reverend, and he is in the last stadium of his life. He is very, very ill, has cancer, and is already confined to his sickbed. Before he dies, he has only one wish. He wants to see back his son. I was the son because I was the first uh, one who he took into hiding. I was the first person whom he sheltered. He had no children. Are you willing to come meet and talk to him? He asked me. I said, I step in the car now and will be there in about three quarters of an hour. <coughs> and when I entered his house, he sat behind his desk. He did not want to receive me while laying in bed. We talked for about an hour and before I left, he asked me, Benny, are you willing to come as from now every week? And of course I said, no doubt I will certainly be seeing you next week and looking very, very much forward to it. And the next week I called his wife. She answered the phone and I asked me, I come today. She said, yes, but he is not at home anymore. He is hospitalized in the meantime. She mentioned the clinic where he was accommodated or better hospitalized. An hour later I came at the hospital around 12 o'clock. The porter said, no, you can't go upstairs. It is not visiting, visiting hour yet. You have to come back at three. I revealed him just a little and he said, oh, in that case, you may go upstairs. We talked for about two hours. We shed many, many hot tears and that night he died. <coughs> At a funeral, funeral, you have these books of condolence. Every time when someone wrote his name in the book, there was a man who looked over their shoulder. He did so with us also. And after the ceremony, and after having offered our sympathy to his wife, Crystal and I stood in a corner. The over-the-shoulder over looking man came to us and said, May I ask you a question? Are you Benny? I said, yes, I am. He said with tears in his eyes, will you look at me? Do you recognize me? And I had not the slightest idea. And then he said, I was the gardener with whom you stayed outside when you were allowed to for a couple of hours. A very emotional encounter some 55 years after the war. And now, last but not least, you, dear audience, are certainly well informed concerning the Spielberg testimony. Holocaust survivors could take part in a project, thanks to Spielberg, to have their war story registered on a video, film or tape. I was persuaded by a cousin to partici participate for my descendants, for the future generation. And one of our intermediaries, who was still alive at that time, spoke the closing words of this emotional document. This document is stored in the Jewish Historical Museum in Amsterdam. 
And all of our four children got a copy last March when I became 80. As I told you in the beginning, I was married twice. Unfortunately, my first marriage stranded because of post-war difficulties. My first wife was a victim of the German atrocities. She was locked up with her mother, sister and brother in Bergen-Belsen, the concentration camp west of Berlin, for two and a half years. Physically broken and mentally tortured left many, many incredible and unbelievable marks. The after effect of the two and a half years in that camp was so dramatic that she alienated, her, alienated herself from the world, became shy and was difficult to live with, undermined her constitution in such a bad way that it made our marriage unbearable. I still support her with whatever she needs and we see each other fairly often, especially at birthdays of our children and grandchildren. Mark, our son, is the oldest, he's 54 now, of the children from my first marriage. I have to explain this to have a better understanding of what happened in Israel last June. Mark is a professor in pediatrics, giving lectures over the whole world, a gastroenterologist. And there was a congress in Jerusalem last June. Mark had to give lectures three times a day. On the last day, before flying back to Holland, he had nothing to do for some two and a half hours. He called my sister, who lives in Jerusalem. He said, Yeti, I have a couple of hours and would like to visit the Yad Vashem with a friend whom I studied with. My sister said, I'll pick you up and I'll accompany you. After wandering around, a while she said, let's go to the right to the Children's Museum. <coughs> and Mark said, okay, but I first, first want to have a look in that little room over the left here where I see a lot of books. And the first one he opened, he saw my picture and the whole war story written in that book. He was in tears and shaken. He had to go back to deliver his speech. My sister said, Mark, I've never heard you giving a speech. I will soon be 85, and oh, most probably the last chance to hear you giving a lecture. Can I come with? He said, I don't know. The hall is crowded with some four or to 500 people. Stay in the car, I'll try to get a free pass. And he got the possibility, possibility to allow her to enter. Mark said, sit next to my friend there in the middle. And there she sat in the middle of that large room, surrounded by some 500 doctors. Mark started his lecture and said, normally I would and should start with that what I am here for. But today I feel that I have to make an exception. Standing in front of you, all I now more than ever realize how lucky I am to live in this world. He revealed what happened at the Yad Vashem. My mother survived the concentration camp by the name of Bergen-Belsen, the same camp where Anne Frank died. In spite of the atrocities and hardships, and my father survived by going, going into hiding just on time. And there is another thing. My aunt, my father's sister, also survived. And she is right with us here. She sits there in the middle, the lady with the blonde hair. The audience, one and all, jumped to their feet and applauded for a couple of minutes. I hope that you are not too bored by all these stories. I thought I could not withhold you these special stories or events. I could go on and on. I said I picked up only out only four. This is the first and I can assure you, also the last time that I spoke so long and openly about the time during World War II. 
You can only imagine how grateful I am for my wife's never unremitting support and understanding. She, my crystal, is my ministering, devoted, committed angel in life, a life that is for us survivors from time to time so difficult. And as you can understand, not always easy to live with. Dear auditorium, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your willingness and patience having listened to my war story. I'm really honored that so many of you have taken the time and the patience to come and listen to what I had to say. I also want to thank, to thank different people in this audience who have sent me emails with the best wishes for a speedy recovery during my eye problem. <coughs> in particular, I want also, we, Crystal and I, want to thank Carolyn and Henry Frozen for having made possible this very, very special evening. I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And last but not least, I want to thank El Molengar for having organized this opportunity. If there are any questions, I am willing to answer them in my poor English. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. We'll be glad to take questions, and I'm going to try to repeat them, whatever you say. So please speak up. It's a big hall, and there are a lot of people in here. Then tell the story about Karina and the, the uh, Olympics and so forth. Okay, the question is to tell about Karina and the Olympics. <laughs> I don't think if that is appropriate in this. <laughs> well, our daughter, who is a lawyer, uh, studied in America at Norfolk University. We in Holland are very devoted field hockey players. And she introduced field hockey in America, in, at school over there, at, at, at the university. She was the captain of the national Dutch team for five years. She had a gold medal here in Los Angeles in 1984, a bronze medal in 19, 1988 in um, Korea, Seoul, and was the first woman for Holland who brought the flag in, the Dutch flag, uh, in the stadium in Barcelona. She was knighted for that by the Queen. She was nominated twice in her life, best player in the world, and probably we Dutch it's a V, I'm not talking, I don't have to talk about V because I'm not playing. But the Dutch, as well as the men, as the women, are champions, are probably the best in the world. And then Karina became the coach of the American team. <laughs> and she had to go and come here over. The, they, they trained in, uh, in New Jersey. So everybody who was participating in, in the team uh, uh, had to travel to New Jersey and Karina came from Holland. And probably even a better performance than her gold medal was that she trained the American team so well that at the first World Championships the, the Americans beat the Dutch. <laughs> And, and, and became third, probably for the first, but also for the last time in history. <laughs> yeah. uh, other questions? Um, 
professor. So I understood that you were a Presbyterian, practicing your Presbyterian religion for a year. Yes. Did you then have the opportunity to be bar mitzvah when you took yes. the Yes, I did, in 1947. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think it's. Can no, I have a question? Yeah. Ben, I know you've spoken to the fact that you missed schooling. You, were, you spent three years with no benefit of schooling. But Ben now speaks six languages. How did you learn some of the languages? Yeah. Um, she addressed the fact that he had had no schooling for many years and sort of started at, at a deficit, but yet he knows six languages now. How did that happen? <laughs> um, in my words towards you, I told you of the lack of school, education, and I think the biggest miss in my life, personally, is that I couldn't go to university because I had no underground, if you it's horrible, but I would have loved to do that. But I tried to recuperate um, the time I lost during the war by going to a school where you could do in one year, two years. And I tell you honestly that within a week, I didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> So I had to leave the school, and my father sent me to several countries, to France. I even came in 1960 to America, and I worked in Wall Street to learn. I worked for a loom factory in Birmingham, not Alabama, but <laughs> in England. And so I learned languages. Um, I had to go, I had no other possibility than going into my father's business. It was not the things I wanted so very much, but I had no other possibility. And uh, we had a showroom, we, we worked with several boutiques and clients in Holland, and we put up a showroom we, we was, were in The Hague, and we put up a showroom in Amsterdam where we sold our stuff to, uh, to clients. And in the time that nobody was there, I studied Italian because I knew that I had to go to Italy and uh, had to learn the language because it's better that if you answer the people in their own language that gives a great advan advantage, sometimes a price advantage. <laughs> and I did and I learned it and yeah, I don't know how but I speak it fluently. <laughs> yes? One of the most moving books I've ever read is uh, Corey Ten Boom's The Hiding Place. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there's one scene in the book where she comes face to face after the war with uh, someone who had fought with the Germans, and she has she pauses for a second to shake his hand uh, because she doesn't know if she can forgive him. But of course, the, the whole concept of forgiveness is uh, uh, prevalent in that book. How has your attitude toward the Germans uh, in light of uh, what you experienced as a child? Uh, so the question is, um, he was referring to Corey Ten Boom's book and how she came, she encountered a German and how she reacted to him and how have you reacted to, to the Germans today? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that is very, I have to tell you a very special story. Um, first of all, uh, Miss uh, Tenboom was knighted together with my daughter. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I told you that my marriage 
my first marriage stranded. And I worked for my father. And I met a friend who was a dear friend. In, he was a German. He came from Munich. And uh, we worked together in a little village in Italy. And he worked for another firm. And on a certain day, he asked me, are you willing to come? I'm giving a reception in Dusseldorf. Are you willing to come to Dusseldorf and participate at my reception? And I said, of course. So I flew instead of flying to Holland, I flew to Dusseldorf. And there I met my crystal. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know how to say it, but listen, I think that I have been very ill this last period. I was operated four times um, since uh, December till the end of January. And I think I wouldn't have survived if my dear crystal wouldn't have behind, st stood behind me. She is, uh, as I said, my, my life, my devoting life. My children adore her. And when we were here, it was Mother's Day. And while our son, who last week, two weeks ago, had an invitation to speak at Harvard, he now, tomorrow or the day after, he is going to speak in Washington. Uh, and I just send him a message. Uh, Dear Mark, lots of success in your, on your trip to Washington. And then he wrote back, say, Crystal, it's Mother's Day, I think, of her. And I think that is, yeah, all there is say to it. She is German, but probably more Jewish now than I am. <laughs> yes, please. Do. During the war, it's very sad, but in the countries that the Nazis occupied, you know, many of the local citizens turned their Jewish neighbors in for money or whatever reason. But probably the most courageous people were in, uh, in Holland. And do you have any... Um no, no, I think you are mistaken. Um, I don't know exactly the percentage in Holland that lost their lives uh, through the Germans, but I think it's about around 80% which is a very high percentage. That's the reason that I said they could have done more, but okay, you can't blame them for that because it was absolutely incredibly dangerous. So uh, I think there are two countries probably, uh, and I don't know if I pronounce the countries well, but first of all, in Greece, it was absolutely horrible. I don't know, also 80% or 85%. And there is another country, not one single person survived, and that was Luthania. Not one single. And everybody, the farmers, the men in the street, they all collaborated with the Germans. Yes. found what he did of the Holocaust because there's some people that don't think it ever happened. And I'm thankful that, that General Eisenhower did film what he did. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yes? I want to thank you, sir, very much for coming. And um, I have two little children. We have lots of children here. Is there any message of, uh, is there any lesson that you think that we can learn? Because there is so much hatred and murder, and you speak of forgiveness. 
could learn? That is. Children could learn. Yeah, but that is a difficult question. I must say that I'm, and I think I'll speak. I speak also for Crystal and probably for all of you that I'm surprised that so many young people came here to listen. I think it's outstanding, it's fantastic, it's incredible. But yes, it depends probably on education. And um, it is difficult. Uh, we live in a very dangerous world, I think. A dangerous world where the Muslims grow and grow and grow. And the only thing you can do is behave as you should, listen to your parents, listen to your teachers, and probably that will help you to, yeah, how do I say, to be a, a good human being in life. We have a, a Dutchman. Uh, he is very radical, but he has one expression that is f absolutely fantastic. He says, not all the Muslims are terrorists, but all the terrorists are Muslims. And uh, can you imagine that already, I think, I'm, I'm not absolutely sure, but that already 65% of Rotterdam is Muslim. 65%. Which is for us, yeah, incredible. Yes, sir. It is a young student. Well, this presentation be available on DVD or CD? Uh, um, we are taping it, and we uh, we will try to put it on the BHEC website so that anyone can open it. And yes. A, the, oh. the boy wants to ask a question. Yeah. I'd Don't like just. To hear it. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, come next to me, come here, come next to me and speak in the speaker. What are the six languages that you speak? <laughs> no. What are the six languages that you speak? <laughs> Dutch, of course, easy. Um, I speak. Uh, German, I speak Italian, I speak French, and when I had to do business in China, I also tried the Chinese language. It's very difficult, but I managed somehow. <laughs> and the sixth is a little bit Hebrew. Can you count to ten? I beg your pardon? Can you count to ten in Chinese? No. <laughs> Not, not any, not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> Could you share with us a little bit about your sister's story from her? Yeah, it's, 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 it's my, my si Yeah, I will. My sister is um, a very intelligent person. She worked. Her husband was an American. He fought in the Second World War in Belgium. Mm -hmm. He was a tank commander and they crossed a bridge and the tank fell uh, off the bridge into a river. He jumped out, he broke his foot, he went back to America mm -hmm. and he studied for a certain time economics. And then the war broke out in Israel, and he went to Israel and fought in '48 for Israel. He became, uh, at certain times, he was the head of the terrorist department in Jerusalem and Israel. He also became a charge d'affaires, that's the right hand of an ambassador. In uh, and. He also became an ambassador in Kenya, in Nigeria, in Rome, and in Japan. And Chicago. A big Chicago. Chicago. And Chicago. Yeah, but Chicago, he was not an amb ambassador, he was a consul general. He was surprised 
At that time, I remember that there was so much marriage in, in, in America between Jews and non-Jews. And he um, was a remarkable man. He, uh, he worked at a certain time for Netanyahu, but he hated his wife so much that he didn't want to work for them anymore. <laughs> He, um, he, uh, he had uh, Parkinson, and he, on a Friday evening, I remember, he went to the hairdresser, and he came out, he fell with his head on the street, and he died. My sister lives alone since 1995, I think. She has three daughters, and, yeah, she ex 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 uh, does exactly the same as I do, and she never speaks about the Holocaust. Never, never, never. Ne we have never spoken to each other after the war about our separation. Uh, yeah, what can I say? She is remar remarkable. Yeah, yeah. How did you and your family? Uh, reconnect through what what manner did you get together? How did how did you and your family reconnect after the war? Reconnect in what sense? Physically. 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 Yeah. Find each other. Yeah. Well, uh, that was very, very difficult, I can tell you. Um, because I, I don't know my parents had to pick up life again. We had lost everything, even our house. And when we came back from hiding, my father had to buy back his own house because it was confiscated. It was first, it went to one of these, you said, Quisling people, and later on to the Germans. And Life was very difficult at that time. We didn't, yeah, I, of course my mother stayed home, but my father we didn't see very often because he traveled back and forth to pick up life again. And yeah, life was absolutely very, very, very difficult. And you, you can't compare characters. But the man, one person is more depressed or uh, takes it for uh, a bad thing than other ones. And I always, yeah, I must say I couldn't stand it. And, and that's why I said I'm very grateful to my crystal because without her, probably, I don't know, but uh, it's for us, for me, I know that it's difficult to live with. Because um, yeah, now the fifth, the fourth of May, okay, okay. <laughs> the fourth, the fourth of May, we always have uh, we we have commemoration of the death, and the fifth, we always um, have uh, what we Liberation Day in Holland. It's uh, and uh, uh, it's. Uh, also, very, very many, many young people go to these commemorations, and I must say, it's uh, it's uh, even every year now, even now, 70 years after the war. What is it? Uh, it's 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 fantastic that also so many young people go there and uh, be aware of what happened. But as I told you before between, it, I'm talking for myself now, life was never again as it should have been. And the relationship between our parents, unfortunately, I also alienated because my parents were my farm, the, the war parents, that were my parents. And I admired them till this very moment. Yeah? Is Crystal here? And if she is, can you introduce her to us? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm here.
questions. Yes. Did I understand correctly that you said that you had become converted to your war parents' uh, religion? And if so, how did that happen? How did it happen? Well, um, yeah, th that happens when you. Uh, I think that. Um, I think that a person who loves the Jews but goes to a country, let's say Egypt, is caught and is put into prison. prison. And every day again they put him, they give him the papers from all these Arab countries around Israel and they say, look what the Jews do to the Palestinians, to shooting here, putting up a wall. And if you do that constantly, you are going to believe. Hey, and then you say you are in prison, you are a Jew, and say, oh, these bad Jews. And that's what, exactly what happened with my religion. You, I, I, I can tell you that we in Holland, when we, and she is my testimony, that every Sunday morning you have a singing on the radio and choirs and, and people sing psalms from the Bible and everything. And I can tell you, I know them by heart. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so, if you are in a family who prays with folded hands, reading the Bible, I, uh, I became, yeah, also probably, I was also probably converted to Protestantism. Not after the war, it took me a year to get back to be a Jew and, and but is that is that satisfactory? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll take one more question. That's it, and then we're gonna have to call it a night. Yeah. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> to you. Um, nice. You mentioned that um, so you're a good family friends. They paid a bunch of money to go and um, to go to Switzerland, but they were betrayed. So, did you find that with people who attempted to get out of German-occupied zones or just go into hiding, were the people who had like better situations were they the wealthy ones, or is it just pretty much a free for all? Yeah. Yeah. So, so she's asking if you had money, did you have a better chance of surviving? Is that what you're asking, sort of? Yes, sir. Okay, now listen. That, um, I, I, it's, uh, many Jews before the war in Amsterdam were in the diamond business, in the jewelry business. And they sometimes could pay their lives with diamonds. So if they went to the Germans and said, listen, I'll pay you, let me go to England, or let me go to America, they paid. And there is a story which is, I think is horrible, that there was a diamond, but there was a diamond family, there was a diamond family by the name of Asher, A-S-C-H-E-R, and they were very big diamonds, uh, uh, sellers and cutters and everything. And he also approached the Germans at a certain moment and said, listen, I am willing to do anything if you leave me, if you let me go and my family to America. And the Germans said, okay, we will give us the diamonds. And he gave the diamonds. And they let his family go except him and he died in the concentration camp so and that is that more or less but uh, i don't think 
that you could pay for your safety. You could not pay. Having money enough or not enough, that, that was, they just hated the Jews and uh, what happened in, in Germany. And, and let's hope that it never, never, never happens again. Thank you. On behalf of the Birmingham community, we would like to thank you for sharing your story with us tonight. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you.